everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Lunch and Learn update on the Maine Climate Council. Hannah Pingree, Director of the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, or GOPIF, and Brian Ambrett, GOPIF Senior Climate Resiliency Coordinator, will walk us through the Maine Climate Council's work to develop a new climate action plan. Next slide. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. I've also had the pleasure of working with Hannah and Brian on the Climate Council. And our organizations, MCV and MCA, have worked to protect Maine's environment and our democracy by building diverse coalitions, influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Next slide. A few technical notes for today. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. You can send your questions to me, Kathleen, through the chat at any point. Uh, you can find the chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen, and I'll keep track of those questions to ask during the Q&A at the end. If you have any technical difficulties, please message Will Sedlak through that chat feature. Our program is being recorded today and we will post the video on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you again for joining us. Director Pingree will start us off with an overview of the Climate Council's goals, process, and progress so far, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Hannah, I will turn it over to you. Great, I am just getting my act together here, unmuting myself, and gonna share a few slides. Will is my um, technical supporter. All right, I'm just gonna make sure I do it the right way. You got it, Anna. Almost there, all right. Well, great, well, thank you so much um, for having uh, Brian and I here to talk to you about the work of the Maine Climate Council. Um, obviously, it is a time in which I'm sure that most on this call don't need any convincing that action on climate change is urgent and necessary. Um, certainly a priority for the state of Maine, but a priority for uh, folks living in this country and around the world. The, this week's past headlines have been pretty stark, watching the wildfires out west, um, you know, incredible hurricane and flooding activity in the south, news headlines about sea level rise, climate migration, uh, certainly stories around the world about the hardships we are already seeing because of the impacts of climate. So uh, the, the issues are urgent and essential. Um, and certainly, uh, as you'll hear today, uh, the Climate Council is focused on the approach that the state of Maine takes um, as, as partners in this work. Um, so my name is Hannah Pingree. Again, I am the director of the Governor's Office of Policy and Innovation in the Future. I'm also the co-chair of the Maine Climate Council. And Brian and I are going to walk you through a little bit of the Maine Climate Council's process, how we got to where we are today, which is um, really uh, in the middle of um, the decision making for a four year climate action plan for our state. Um, I just do want to just thank again Kathleen, um, who served as the co chair of our buildings group, did an incredible job in one of the really important sectors for our state. And I know um, there are others out there. Um, on this, I saw Ivan Fernandez on the list, the, the chair of our science and technical subcommittee, again, one of our most important groups um, and others. And, and so um, I will just say that this work is really a labor of hundreds of people across our state who have spent countless hours in meetings on Zoom calls. Um, and again, it's not about the meetings, but about the importance of the issues and, and finding concrete ways to take action. Um, I will also say that Maureen um, from LCV and uh, Beth both served on working groups as well. So again, we appreciate all of Maine conservation voters um, really digging into this work with us. Um, so obviously, uh, the governor has made tackling climate change one of her key issues. Um, she, from her inaugural speech, um, talk about the importance of tackling climate change as, as really one of the fundamental issues 
um, that Maine and, and certainly our country and world are now facing. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the Maine Climate Council today, but I will just say that, that really um, the governor's focus on protecting Maine's environment, um, on supporting natural resource industries in a way that protects our environment, encouraging uh, clean energy, uh, renewable energy um, has been a focus of her administration. Um, one of the first things she did as governor is, is um, had the state of Maine join the U.S. Climate Alliance, um, now an alliance of 25 states um, working uh, to try to meet the Paris climate goals. I think many people know that one of Trump's first actions as president was to start um, the process of pulling the U.S. out of um, the Paris Climate Accords and the U.S. Climate Alliance, the 25 states have committed um, to meeting those goals. Um, she's also taken many other actions from um, signing the legislation that created the most um, aggressive renewable portfolio standard in the country, 80% clean energy required by 2030, um, pulled, you know, really folks focused on issues like offshore wind, um, how we install more heat pumps in Maine. So she has started taking action from the beginning of her term and really believes that, that this is essential. So one of the um, one of the first pieces of the legislation the governor put in was a, an act to create the Maine Climate Council and commit Maine to um, specific targets to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the Maine Climate Council is created in law. It is a long-term council focused on meeting the state's um, climate goals. Um, and it is, it, it is um, there are targets that are in law. So it's not just you know, a goal, we wanna do this. Um, there are specific requirements um, that the state must meet. Um, so those specifics are we must reduce emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, 45% um, by 2030 and at least 80% by 2050. Um, the governor also signed an executive order that requires to, the state to achieve in carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, part of the Climate Council statute also is about ensuring that Maine people, industries, communities are resilient to the impacts of climate change. How do we help our state adapt? Um, clearly, reducing our emissions um, is the first thing we need to do, but the, the efforts to really help our state become more resilient are key. Um, so this is, uh, the, the start of this work is, is about delivering a climate action plan by December 1 of this year, a four-year climate action plan, um, and then redoing that plan every four years um, to continue to work towards these goals. So how are we doing this work? Um, the, the Climate Council legislation laid out a 39-member Climate Council with scientists, industry leaders, um, uh, state and local officials, both Republicans and Democrats, um, people from uh, local communities, from stakeholder groups, a youth representative, a tribal representative, and others are part of the Maine Climate Council. The Climate Council then had uh, six working groups. Um, you can see on your screen, transportation, minimize my screen here, transportation, energy, natural and working lands, coastal and marine, buildings, infrastructure, and housing, as well as we called it our super group, the, the mouthful community resilience planning, public health, and emergency management. And those groups had, uh, as you'll see, hundreds of, of people from around our state volunteered, put in tons of hours and time, eventually on Zoom, um, to make recommendations to the Maine Climate Council for action. Um, the kind of, I think one of the most important parts of our work is listening to the scientists, really understanding the science of what's happening in Maine and making sure we're, we're being driven by data. And so we also have um, a really amazing and high level group of scientists um, led by Ivan Fernandez and Bob Marvini um, on our science and technical subcommittee. So where are we now? Um, you know, where are where is the state in terms of reducing our emissions? So this chart helps to see, helps to both understand our goals and where we are. This is the trajectory of our state. So at this point, based on the state's most recent DEP emissions report, we are about 17% below 1990 levels. Uh, we had a uh, we have a requirement to be at least 10% below by 2020. That's based on old law. And then we have to get to a 45% reduction by 2030, and again, uh, at least 80% by 2050. So it's, uh, this graph you know, shows you the path. And again, uh, I will just say that this is um, 
incredibly important work, but also hard work, hard work that's happening around the country and around the world. Um, a lot of countries making similar goals um, and, and unfortunately some of them are already falling short um, on some of their, some of this work. So how do Maine's, trans how do Maine's uh, emissions break down? So as you can see um, by this, uh, this illustration, uh, the majority of Maine's emissions, a little bit unique in the country, come from transportation. 54% from transportation emissions, 19% from uh, residential buildings, 11% from commercial buildings, 9% uh, from our industrial sector, and 7% from electric power. So this, this obviously shows really the, the challenge is, is primarily in our transportation and buildings. Um, again, Maine uh, really stands out, probably the rural nature of our state, the fact that our industry is, is somewhat limited, um, just huge amounts coming from really decisions that we all make about driving and, and, our, and our homes and our heating systems. So the Climate Council has some guiding principles that come out of our law. Um, I've talked about the importance of improving the resilience of Maine's communities, people, and industries to climate change effects, um, prioritizing the welfare of Maine citizens, especially the most vulnerable communities, looking for ways through our, our Climate Council process to foster the value of the state's natural resources and natural resource industries in our work, encouraging diversity, inclusion, and equity of all Maine people and communities as a part of this work, and you'll hear a little bit more about our specific um, equity assessment um, a little bit later, and then utilizing the most recent science and technical information to, and measuring our progress as part of our work. So that sort of a, a, bit, a bit repetitive, but these are the goals. So we're, we've started to put together a framework. We have received um, tons of different information and we're now figuring out how to put it all together in a package. And we, and the Climate Council really at this point has, has four kind of overarching goals. How do, through our climate work, do we create jobs and economic opportunity for people in our state? Obviously incredibly relevant during a time of both economic recession and upheaval. Our second goal really among our most important, how do we reduce Maine's greenhouse gas emissions um, by the target set in law? How do we prepare Maine residents, business and communities for the impacts of climate change? And how do we ensure that Maine climate strategies are equitable? So this is just a little bit about our process and timeline. Um, we are in the uh, yellow bubble right now. So we kicked off our Maine Climate Council process uh, last June of in 2019. It, it seems like an eternity ago. Um, in, in September of this past fall, um, the Climate Council really started our work in working groups. We spent the entire fall and winter and into the spring developing the specific recommendations that came out of our working groups. Um, over the summer, we took this information out to the public. We got over 4,000 uh, public comments on our surveys, as well as many other detailed public comments that are continuing to come in about how many people feel about the strategies that have been proposed. Um, we also layered on, and you'll hear a little bit about this, um, additional information. We're looking to a group of consultants who have given us actual modeling analysis of the recommendations and what they will do to help us get to our goals. Um, and as well as we're working, as, as I mentioned, on an equity analysis to really understand the implications for all main people of the recommendations. Um, we are now in kind of the, we're calling it the third inning and it's a short inning, um, trying to get ourselves um, to the recommendations due by December 1. So the Climate Council um, is now really deliberating. We have a ton of um, solid proposals before us. We have to prioritize them, consider implementation and funding. How do we really, so it's really the bottom line of how do we make these things happen? Um, so the Climate Council, again, is, is deliberating September, October, November, um, trying to make the hard decisions and prioritize um, to try to deliver a report that's required in law to the legislature and governor by December 1. Um, so there's a number of different reports that sort of help to s support our work. Um, as I mentioned, um, the Science and Technical Subcommittee, uh, a really valuable and sort of leading part of um, grounding our work. Uh, they are just now publishing their assessment of climate change impacts on Maine. One of their specific requirements in law was to make a specific recommendation around sea level rise 
Um, a ton of planning and policy and regulation will, will come from this rec recommendation. And it's a significant one for a state with thousands of miles of coastline. So they've recommended that we consider committing to manage for one and a half feet of relative sea level rise by 2050 and nearly four feet by 2100. And they also recommended preparing to manage for up to three feet of relative sea level rise by 2050 and nearly nine feet by 2100. Um, I live on an offshore island and I know, you know, these numbers sound significant to some people and minor to others, but I think most people who really looked at our floodplain mapping know, know that this is really, this is um, significant and essential um, and, and will really change um, the character of our coastline, um, especially if, if we don't think proactively about planning and adaptation. So some of the other um, pieces of work um, that are, are coming together to inform the council, um, we worked with the Eastern Research Group and Synapse um, consultants um, to really provide um, uh, detailed uh, data, economic analysis and modeling analysis for the Climate Council. Um, they provided vulnerability mapping of our entire um, state and coast, especially. Um, they produced a report on the cost of doing nothing, so really the the cost if, if the state didn't take action uh, to either mitigate climate change or, or adapt, what it would mean for our economy, what it would mean for our communities and coastline. Um, they produced a greenhouse gas modeling report. Again, incredibly important to see how the strategies proposed will help get us to the 45% reduction goal by 2030, um, as well as an economic analysis. So a cost benefit analysis of all the ideas that have come out of the working groups. Um, I would, Climate, the, the, our website is um, climatecouncil.maine.gov. Um, all these reports are available if you've got hours of free time. Um, I will say there's a couple of summary analysis that are really helpful and I highly recommend uh, you read the summary report of, of what these consultants have provided for us. The two other things that are coming um, just in the next week or two are a clean energy economy report, something we're required to produce by law, but something really exciting. Uh, that I think will add a lot to our work. So we know that um, this work of a transition to a less carbon intensive economy will actually offer a lot of economic opportunity. Everything from re renewable energy jobs to efficiency to infrastructure. Um, so the clean energy economy report is really how do we take advantage of the opportunity of, of this work to, to decarbonize um, our economy. Uh, and the other report um, is the equity assessment. So we work with the Mitchell Center at the University of Maine um, and a group of advisors to really look and think carefully about all of the recommendations and how we can figure, think about implementation in an equitable way, how we think about those most vulnerable communities and people and how we best engage them in our work and our implementation going forward. So I'm going to pass it to um, Brian on my team. Um, I have an incredible staff of whom uh, Brian is one, and I will say we are a small and mighty staff. There are only a handful of us, three or four of us, um, doing a lot of heavy lifting staff-wise on this. Um, but we have taken the, the incredible work of the working groups and put them together um, into uh, six different recommendations or strategies um, to consider um, for the Maine Climate Council this fall. Um, Brian's just going to give you a high-level overview of, of what's in these um, buckets. Thanks, Hannah, and thanks, Kathleen, for having us back. Great to be here again. Um, the uh, recommendations that you see here, um, you may have seen as they were um, developed by the working groups back in June and transmitted to the council back then. Over the summer, we, um, as Hannah said, uh, took possession of all of these different types of analyses and reports. And we did a lot of work to include that context into a framework um, that encompasses all of these strategies now. And that framework comes in two parts. And this is uh, a summary of part one, reducing Maine's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you'll see here the, the three areas of emphasis, transportation, modernizing buildings, uh, and reducing emissions in energy and industrial sectors. Um, and so there's been a lot of information sort of summarizing the reports, adding that uh, information into each of these um, action areas um, and really trying to build out both the case um, and, the, and the justification for, um, for the, the plan moving forward. 
So I'm not going to read through all of these. You can take a look, and if you want to uh, go deeper on any of them, um, Hannah gave you the website, climatecouncil.maine.gov. It's all there with many, many more layers of information behind these. Um, but what I will do is pull up a couple of themes that run across all of these, uh, these recommendations. The first is using uh, less electricity through efficiency and alternative uh, fuels that may be less carbon intensive. Um, and so that has you know, been something that's been important. We've known about the benefits of energy efficiency for, for decades now. Um, that's, it's true in our transportation and in our buildings. Um, but the idea generally is to cut down the amount of electricity that we need, which is important because the second theme is electrifying a lot of those things that we can't really replace or, or make as efficient as, as necessary. That's uh, driving our vehicles, um, heating our homes and buildings. Um, we have recommendations in here for electrifying those, um, those energy uses through uses of electric vehicles, uh, for driving, for heat pumps, for heating our homes. Um, and those are going to add to the demand on the electrical grid. So the, the combination of efficiency and electrification really necessitate the third theme that comes out of that, and that is cleaning up the grid. Getting the uh, renewable energy onto the grid, getting uh, dirtier fuels off of the electric grid, so that as we uh, increase our consumption of electricity through driving electric vehicles and heating our homes, the sources of that electricity is, is much cleaner and has a lower um, and eventually getting to zero carbon footprint. Um, so those are the three themes across um, the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies. Um, they really tie in together nicely. And then uh, part two of the, of the framework is how we prepare the state and our communities for the impacts that we know are coming, um, that are already here, that are projected, um, and that may be projected to get worse. Um, so looking across these three categories, building healthy and resilient communities, that's a lot about the support that the state can provide to communities. Investing in climate ready infrastructure, uh, we know we have a lot of infrastructure needs uh, in Maine and nationwide, even without trying to uh, adapt them for climate change. So we should be doing those both together. And then protecting uh, our environment and natural resource economies and working with natural climate solutions. And so the three themes that come uh, out of this um, category are, are really around um, applying the best science and making sure that we continue to monitor uh, the impacts of climate change in Maine, um, having us close to real-time information for decision makers um, and policy makers to be able to um, anticipate and react to uh, the changes that we see in our communities and in our ecosystems. Second theme around technical assistance, making sure that not only are we helping out our towns and their planning and preparations for climate change, but we're helping landowners, small business owners, um, think about the, the changes that might affect um, how they manage their business or how they manage their, uh, their land um, will be really important. Nature-based solutions offer a really uh, cost-effective and, effect and, and, and actually effective, effective way of um, protecting community and important uh, infrastructure or other assets um, while sequestering carbon and uh, promoting everything from um, fisheries health to um, you know, wetlands and public access and recreational areas, um, really, really great co-benefits that come out of nature-based solutions. And then lastly, um, updating the state laws and programs so that they are incorporating climate change, the projections, the science, the adaptation principles, um, so that we're really building better tools for communities to use to plan and prepare for climate change. Across all of the six uh, strategy areas, there's some other cross-cutting themes that arose and that the council was chewing on and working on how to incorporate. Um, not surprising, funding is a big one, um, whether it's where the funding comes from or how that funding gets out to communities uh, in ways that incentivize the types of decision-making and behaviors um, that, uh, that are going to be necessary. Uh, the second is workforce development opportunities and job opportunities. Um, lots of the things that we need to do um, can support uh, high quality, good paying jobs in Maine. So um, it's important to pull that up where we can. 
Um, and lastly, education and awareness building, um, making, uh, getting information out to, to Mainers, to students, um, so that people have uh, information, accurate information, access to the science, uh, and then they can educate themselves about the impacts in Maine and what that means uh, for them and for the decisions that they make uh, to reduce their carbon footprint and prepare their families. So with that, I'll turn it back to Hannah. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, so just a, a couple last comments on sort of where we are and next steps. Uh, Brian did a good job of, of talking about all of the sort of um, actions and strategies that have been proposed. Um, and we are now digging into decision making um, and, uh, and, and, and implementation. So that's uh, kind of the, the heavy lifting work, but the important work. Um, so just a little bit of what's next. Um, if you're a real climate junkie and you want to stay with us in this work, we have three upcoming webinars um, that are for our 39 climate council members, but open to the public. Um, really diving deep on our cost benefit analysis and modeling. Um, that's an upcoming webinar um, next week, as well as an overview of our scientific assessment um, led by our scientists, including again, Ivan Fernandez on this call. Um, uh, that's next Friday. Um, and we will also be pr presenting our equity assessment um, next Tuesday, September 29th, or two Tuesdays from now. Um, Again, an incredibly important part of our work. Um, the Mitchell Center will be presenting that and we'll hear a little bit from some of our equity advisors on just what they think is important um, in thinking about equity as a part of climate implementation. Uh, starting October 1, the Climate Council will, will have one of its two October meetings where we'll really start thinking um, about decision making and implementation. Um, we'll meet twice in October, again in November, um, hoping to finalize, vote, and approve uh, the four-year climate action plan by December 1. Um, so that's really uh, the meat of the work. Um, the Maine Climate Council will continue to meet quarterly um, after that. And really, while it's the meat, it's also the start of our work because proposing plans, action steps, um, that is really kind of creating a framework for, for how we get to where we need to be. But all of that will require incredibly heavy lifting going forward, heavy lifting by legislators, by the governor, by people forming budgets. Um, I will say by community members, uh, planning boards, um, city council members, and really all main people thinking about how do we, what is each of our role in this plan? How do we change um, the way we heat our homes? How do we change our transportation systems, um, how do we each make decisions that will support the kind of ultimate action that, that we need as a state. So I will just leave it at, um, we, this work, we've worked as hard as we possibly can to be inclusive and hear from Maine people. Um, we have lots of ways that you can stay engaged with our work. We're on all the social media websites for better or worse. Um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we try to post things regularly on what's happening. Um, we're always happy to come and speak to groups about the work of the Climate Council. Um, we encourage you to contact us with your ideas and suggestions. Uh, we have a formal comment period on the draft set strategies that ends on September 24th. Um, that's so we can really package up all the um, specific suggestions that have been given to the council members so that they can read them as they make their decisions. But of course, we always are happy to take your comments anytime. Um, so really with that, um, Brian and I are, are um, happy to be here, happy to share the information about what we're doing, um, but we'd love to hear your questions and comments. Um, I know that maybe Kathleen will, will help lead that, but um, this is, I think, uh, we've talked a lot about plans and work, um, but I, I think we really all recognize that, that action is where, is the place we all wanna be. Um, action, at the state level, we certainly um, are looking forward to a federal government that will really engage actively on climate issues. We've had some very positive discussions with the U.S. Climate Alliance um, with both um, with our delegation, um, with the House Committee um, focused on these issues. So uh, clearly, when we think about recovering from the, the economic period um, our state and country is in, we, we really believe that we can we can build back better um, in ways that will make a big difference on climate issues. So again, happy to answer questions. And um, again, thanks for, for being here the, during your lunch break. 
Thank you so much, Hannah and Brian. The, the work that you all and your whole office and, and really the entire Climate Council have done is just astounding. And we're really grateful for your leadership. Uh, we're also aware that <laughs> this is the beginning. So um, we've got a lot of great questions about how people can, uh, can get involved and keep those coming, everybody. Um, but first, many of you know that this is the part of our Lunch and Learn program where we share a call to action. Um, as Hannah said, we're in the beginning stages of our climate action work and you can follow along and support the Climate Council process. Uh, the website is a great place to sign up for the email. Uh, list and we will share that link in our follow-up email this afternoon. Uh, there are also social media links right here. And the other piece is that we are really focused on helping each other make a plan to vote. Our leaders matter and you have a chance to weigh in. So I'm gonna sh share a poll right now. Um, how are you planning to vote? Have you requested your absentee ballot already? Are you making that request today? Let us know. All right, we're gonna share those, whoops. Oh, Kathleen, I, I relaunched it for you. So okay, we're... thank you. If you already voted, if you could vote again, that would be great. We... Voting twice is okay on this poll. And if you did receive multiple absentee ballot requests in the mail, they are not absentee ballots themselves. And if you only, you only need to put in a ballot request once. So don't worry if you get like 15 in the mail. And fabulous. The vast majority of you have already done that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our voting plan here at Maine Conservation Alliance. We are working to make sure that everybody gets to vote safely this election. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to help increase absentee voting. So if you are interested in that, just let us know. We will provide some ways to getting involved in the uh, follow-up email this afternoon. Thanks. All right, let's get into the questions. All right. Um, Hannah, you said that we're in the third inning. When is the game over? When does the plan get enacted? How do we know where we are in this process? The third inning, now I said that the other day at our, our last climate council meeting and I don't, maybe it's an, an overestimate, underestimate. I think for the climate council itself, we are really in the throes of decision-making, um, trying to make important decisions and prioritize the actions that Maine needs to take to start getting us uh, on the path to the reductions required in law um, and, and really all, all the things that need to be done um, to support really exciting ideas that have come out of the Maine Climate Council um, so that we're kind of in the third inning of the work getting to December 1 and a plan but the plan is really I would say the beginning of the next phase. Um, there's just so much that needs to happen um, to think about how do we make um, our buildings more efficient our transportation system to really revolutionize it, to help preparing our communities infrastructure-wise for um, just a ton of adaptation work and planning and, and action that needs to happen. So I would say um, we're, we're, we're near the end of, a, of, of this process, but there's so much heavy lifting that needs to happen. Um, certainly the legislature coming back in January will be considering um, a number of, of the Climate Council's recommendations in varying ways. And again, the Climate Council will recommend which things come first, um, but then there's obviously a lot more to happen. Um, you know, Brian can talk a little bit more, but we certainly hope to engage um, Maine's hundreds of communities in this work, and many of them have already been proactive. Um, we've had, uh, I would say, thousands of youth, youth activists who've engaged in our work, who are working at, you know, the local level, working in their schools and communities to try to take action. So um, there's, there's, uh, really, I would say we need all main people engaged in this work. Um, and, and it's, you know, I think when people the, fully understanding the challenges of the climate crisis around the world, um, it, this will be something I think that, 
that state and local and national and international governments are, are considering for many, many years to come. But obviously, you know, Maine wants to be proactive and, and do as much as we can um, starting today. So third inning may be wrong analogy, but we're, 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 we're nearly there in a plan. So that's a good start. There you go. There you go. And, and how are you feeling about the way that plan is coming together? Are we on track to meet those statutory goals? I would say um, I feel really good about the plan and the work. Um, to be really specific, our modeling analysis shows um, us about 90% of the way there in terms of the strategies proposed by the working groups getting us to the 45% um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. I think we're, as a council, going to consider in the next couple of weeks, you know, what do we add to that plan to get us to the, the full reduction? Um, but I would say, again, those are just the, the actual, um, the, the ideas to get us there and then implementing the plans. I mean, you know, we are way, way behind many states in terms of people driving EVs, um, thinking about public transportation. Um, we're doing a pretty good job of installing heat pumps. We're probably leading the country in electrifying our heating system, but we were a state that was probably among the most reliant on oil heating. So we have a lot, a long ways to go, Kathleen, as, as you know. So um, I would say still a lot to do. And there are obviously some, some unique constraints on state funding at this moment, shall we say. And um, Given all of those constraints, what kind of priority are, are you giving to market-based approaches to some of the, the strategies we'll need to enact? I would say, um, I mean, clearly we're in a position of, you know, the state is looking at a shortfall in terms of, of balancing our state budget. Uh, the, the picture of our economy as a, as a state and country is, is challenged, certainly challenged by the recession brought on by COVID. Um, so that is not where we want to start this work with, you know, without a lot of extra state resources to, to do the work. But I would say the Climate Council includes many of the commissioners of, of, the, of the agencies engaged in this work, from transportation um, to the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, Marine Resources. Um, all of those commissioners are really thinking creatively about how do we use the resources we have to start to take action. Um, I would say clearly we need more resources though to do all of this work and we are trying to think um, aggressively, creatively, uh, long term about how we do that. Um, I would say that um, we certainly again are looking um, to the federal government to show leadership and there have been conversations about economic recovery that would invest in climate and we have been encouraging our delegation um, to do that and I would encourage all of you to do the same. Um, but the state has also um, has engaged in um, uh, conversations with other states, especially in, in the Northeast region, about how to uh, invest in climate um, collectively. So the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is, is one example of that, a very successful uh, uh, example of a carbon market that has reduced our industrial emissions and helped us invest in um, energy efficiency. Um, and I think that that's an example certainly that people are looking to um, for, for national carbon markets. There's a conversation going on right now about transportation and how we do something similar um, as a way to invest in transportation climate work. Um, obviously, the conversations are made difficult by the, the economic period. Um, and I would say, I, I would certainly advocate that for federal leadership on this would make a tremendous difference. If we had a federal government talking about not just sort of regional ideas, but um, national ideas that would um, that would really bolster Maine's work right now. I would I think probably everyone on the call is is aware we're in a headwind. We're working against a federal government that is actively you know rolling back both environmental protections but also um, uh, emissions reductions in, from transportation to you know power plants that have not been helpful. So uh, a lot of states are still working away, but you know partner at the federal level would make a big difference. Yeah, there were a number of questions that came in through the chat about uh, how we how we move the federal administration um, and just what are the connections between the, the work that the Climate Council is doing focused on Maine's climate plan and 
what message we're communicating to our congressional delegation? Well, I would just say, I talk to one of them pretty regularly and she's on board. Um, you know, my mom is a member of Congress and, and has done a lot of climate work really actually leading in the agriculture um, sector on, on uh, really exciting climate ideas to both transform uh, agriculture across the country, but do that in a climate friendly way that really builds more sustainable systems. Um, I would say our entire delegation has been collaborative. Um, they, they all believe in climate change and they've all uh, worked with us on, on funding ideas. Um, but, but clearly we need both an administration and, and a House and Senate that, that can pass legislation. Um, there's some exciting um, pieces of legislation uh, uh, in the Congress, especially on the House side, um, about how we rebuild from this recession um, with significant um, uh, climate action. So I, I, all I can say is the governor has advocated forcefully um, we have um, some good partnerships with our congressional delegation, but we, we clearly need um, a more, <laughs> we need progress at the federal level. And I, I can't tell you, I think we all struggle with how we're gonna make that happen. And obviously something that the main League of Conservation Voters is focused on as well. Yes, I know uh, it might be easier for me to say this than, than for you at this moment, but everybody, there's an election coming up. <laughs> It matters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there's just an example or two of like, what would specifically be different if we had more federal leadership? Like what's, what's something that we're working on doing the best that we can as a state, but just can't get done without, uh, without federal support? I mean, I'll ask Brian to win on the resilient side because I think there's really, when we think about the kind of infrastructure investment we need, a federal partnership and really the, 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 the you know, Maine's resources are limited. So that, I, I bet Brian will come up with a great example. Um, I will say on, on transportation, um, I, I think that the, it, it's again, again a good example. Um, the federal government is moving in the wrong direction on federal fuel emissions uh, efficiency standards. So, um, you know, we're working hard to figure out how to reduce emissions in the transportation sector. Um, it seemed like Detroit and the car makers were with us and the federal government is, is really pushing to move in the opposite direction. So, uh, you know, Maine will continue to work on, on, on EVs and other infrastructure, but we're sort of like just quietly whiling away and without a really uh, significant federal program, um, it's an uphill battle. Um, I will say specifically and especially tax credits, um, some of the tax credits to, to purchase electric vehicles, tax credits around solar, tax credits around renewable energy. Um, those are things the state can do in a limited way, but the federal government, you know, those kind of incentives make a big, big difference when it comes to investment and encouraging new technologies. Um, so those those are areas where where states can try, but lacking federal engagement um, and and or and or having the federal government move in the wrong direction is 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 makes it incredibly difficult to do this work. Um, Brian, you have any brilliant thoughts? Yeah, the infrastructure is a good example, and and to sort of get way down in the weeds, you know the federal funding that's available to states and communities for upgrading infrastructure or reducing risk to flooding or other hazards um, really doesn't fully take into account climate change yet and the future projections. A lot of it is um, looking at historic flood maps that in a lot of places are out of date um, and, and inaccurate. So um, even just getting um, a lot of the science into the way grants um, and decisions about flood risk are made that would be really helpful. But that's, you know, that's a very fine point example right there. Um, but that would be a, a big lift for federal government and needs to be done. I mean, that's, that's really even, helpful. Even to go in a pretty obvious point, obviously, like we've had some groups like NASA and NOAA and, you know, others who have done a lot of good work on climate over the years. And in some of the, there's still, still a lot of great employees there doing good work, um, but starting to, to pull back and be muzzled. So clearly a federal government that can just speak clearly and, and factually about the science and the risks, you know, that's also needed. Well said, thank you. Um, 
Brian, a, a question for you. Can you say a little bit more about the equity analysis? Um, and then I know the, the webinar is probably the best way to get the, the lowdown on that. So maybe some specifics about how folks can sign up for that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the, the Mitchell Center at the University of Maine was very interested in um, helping us apply a, sci a social science lens to a lot of the work that we were thinking about doing um, with the Climate Council. And we um, settled on this idea of doing an equity assessment on the recommendations that came from the working groups back in June. Um, and so they developed a framework um, that really takes into account not just sort of physical vulnerability about where you live and what your climate risk is, but combined it with a lot of the social science around um, vulnerable populations, social vulnerability, um, the things that can compound uh, the types of physical risk that you might have uh, to things like flooding or heat or uh, cold or fires or what have you. Um, so they applied that lens to the recommendations and um, made first an assessment of how a certain policy or recommendation might negatively or positively impact a vulnerable population or a socially uh, marginalized population in Maine. Um, and then they made recommendations for how to improve um, that policy so that it, it would have a more um, proactive stance towards equity and, and um, distribution of benefits. Um, so that report we're hoping to release later today or in the next couple of days. Um, and then the webinar will be a week from next Tuesday and keep an eye on our website, um, climatescouncil.maine.gov for the registration for that. It will be open to the public. That is really exciting. That is the, the, of all of the analysis, there's been so much good analysis that helps us make uh, science-based, fact-based decisions. But this piece is one that I know I'm really looking forward to seeing and um, just so exciting to think that we can tackle this tremendous challenge facing our state and actually use it as a moment to, to make life better for for all main people. Uh, I think it's a, a great example of the sort of synergistic possibility of, of climate action. So thank you. Um, question about public engagement and public education. I know you've done a tremendous amount of outreach uh, and that there's more, more still to do. What does that work look like? Who are the potential partners? Um, how can we help? Um, good question, Kathleen. I would say, you know, from the very beginning, uh, you know, we want this to be a process that Maine people uh, know about, that's transparent, and that has as many people feeling welcome and engaged as possible. So I would say, you know, we started out with the, the six working groups and the science committee, um, having lots of public meetings, um, hearing specifically from stakeholders who are most impacted. Um, they did outreach work to, to experts and others. Um, and taking public input throughout their processes. Um, over the course of the summer, we did a big kind of public polling process um, or, or engagement process through our new website, climatecouncil.maine.gov, really asking people for their opinions on the strategies proposed, uh, got lots of uh, individual comments um, of all kinds, positive and negative about the ideas, what would work for their community. Um, and so that was sort of the next level and we've been using that as to kind of think about how we prioritize. Um, I would say we have a kind of formal comment period happening this fall, again, where people are, are able to give us their input um, via letter form, email, whatever, um, you know, old fashioned letter um, to us about what they think of the strategies, concerns, and we are hearing specifically from, you know, interest groups and stakeholders I like this idea, but when you implement it, you know, don't do it this way or this won't work or, you know, et cetera. So that's happening. Um, and I will just say we will continue to, to do our work in a way that is public. And so people can can pay attention. They can they can, you know, send us emails when they don't like it. Um, and again, we are we are putting together the plan and the implementation plan. Um, but that's really just again, uh, it's a it's a proposal that will require the legislature in many, you know, in, in a lot of the cases to, to review it and weigh in. It will require the governor to put it in a budget. Um, it will require local communities to decide to implement. 
um, it will require Maine people to say, okay, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to call Efficiency Maine and see about their incentive program and decide to install a heat pump in my house or consider buying an electric car. And so there's a lot of um, ways that people can make decisions with or weigh in with their own decision making. So um, that's, there's a lot of ways to stay engaged. I would certainly encourage people to go, to go to our website and sign up for our email list to kind of stay up to date on what's happening. Again, I think uh, the bulk of the work is gonna be long-term. How do we actually make these things happen? And that will require, again, not people just writing one email to their legislator saying, I like this idea or I don't like that idea, but really, you know, stay engaged because there's a lot of pieces to this work and a lot of, you know, painful pieces. Like, you know, if anyone wants to attend meetings on building codes and land use uh, policies, we'll have them coming up in the next couple of years. So they're, they're all going to be really important and it's, it, it's not all sexy work, but it's important work. So um, again, we, we encourage as many people as possible to, to stay engaged because there's a lot of levels to, to making these things happen. That's great. And I know one of the things that, that came up in the Climate Council meetings this week was this idea of, a, of climate education, right, for at the K-12 level, but, but all the way up to, to us, right, to, to the grown-ups in the room, um, to make sure that we have the information we, we need and the understanding. So um, lots of really interesting developments. And, and I'll just even jump in on that. I mean, I will say we've gotten some great, we have some great um, Youth activists who've been on the in the working groups uh, on your right are youth member on the climate council um, who brought together uh, some ideas of really how do we better implement um, education about the impacts of climate, you know, the science behind climate, and and youth are asking for us to engage more fully in that. So, really important piece, but it does speak to both the education and communication that needs to happen, you know, broadly because these are complicated issues, thinking about, you know, all the details of it um, is a lot for anybody, um, but how we communicate the benefits to Mainers um, is going to be really important in the coming years. We have a couple of questions about um, agriculture and Maine's working lands. Our land is, is clearly one of our great assets as a state. Um, can you say a little bit about the uh, agriculture and working lands contribution to carbon emissions and potential contributions to carbon sequestration? Sure. I mean, I will say, you know, I maybe said it too quickly, but I would, I, I think that the, the, the job implications of, of climate activity are, are actually exciting and important and really part of the kind of co-benefits of taking action on climate, especially for a state that is 90% forested, that has a really active forestry and agriculture sector. Um, and also there's implications on the coast for fisheries as well. I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap between our natural resource industries um, and, and climate action. Um, I, I would say there's a ton of um, uh, detail in, in our strategies around uh, how we, um, ensure and increase the sequestration of, um, of carbon um, from Maine's environment. You know, how do we ensure that our significant forests remain and, and become and, and um, increase their ability to, to capture carbon? Um, there's a ton of opportunity in the agricultural sector um, with, with agricultural practices. Um, and at the same time, we can continue to do these things and create, you know, support our farmers. How, you know, how do we utilize and preserve farmland to, to feed more Mainers, um, to support farmers and to support sequestration? There's just a lot of um, opportunities to do this work at multiple levels. Um, I will say that the, the work of developing, you know, carbon sequestration markets or other incentives to encourage um, this is, is, is complicated work. We're, we're starting to talk to other states in the region about how we might do that work together. Um, but, you know, we have Commissioner Amanda Beal, who's, you know, a real advocate for, for agriculture. Um, we have the forest, um, forest products community, um, fishermen, we, they're all kind of engaged and at the table around this work. And I would just, again, say it's, it's, it's a real advantage that Maine has. We have incredible natural lands that I think a lot of all of us believe that are important to our state's economy and, and the beauty of our state, but really make a tremendous difference in our 
contributions um, to reducing carbon emissions and sequestering carbon. So um, that will be, that's kind of one I would say of the highlights of our work and, and one of the unique things that Maine has that, that many other states around the country, you know, don't have quite the same mix. I don't know, Brian, would you add anything to that? You've delved deep into some of these issues as well. Yeah, I think just I would add there's there's some really good good and interesting ideas around food systems work and food security, um, and so um, you know that ties in not only with the the supporting the working lands and the working fisheries, but um, equity concerns as well, and um, re even community resilience and ensuring um, food supplies during emergencies. So um, lots of good work on a number of different areas in there. That's fantastic. It's, it really is a all hands on deck process and it's been fascinating to see so many proposals and uh, so much willingness to, to pitch in and this, this thinking from every sector of Maine's economy and, and across all of our, 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 the whole state and all sorts of people getting involved. So thank you. Um, let's see. I think we probably have time for one more question. And um, I'm wondering what, um, I'm trying to think of one that doesn't op open up too much. What do you see ahead in the next legislative session? We know that um, there were a few things left on the table this session when the, the legislature adjourned uh, because of COVID, but what are you looking forward to for, for the new legislature in 2021? Kathleen, you say that's a small question. That's a big question. Um, you know, I think we are, we're working hard to think about that right now. I mean, the Climate Council is prioritizing and decision making. And I will just say a lot of that work is likely to come back to the legislature. So I would imagine it's going to be, you know, the, the shape and contours of the legislative session are still unclear because, I, you know, we're likely to still be in a pandemic. So how they operate and do their work is, is, is going to be a, a different question. Um, but I would say there will be a number of major pieces of climate legislation that will come before the legislature that will, will need, that will hope and advocate to be enacted. Um, so I would just say there's likely to be a lot on the table you know, on every issue that Brian and I have talked about, it doesn't all require legislation, but a, quite a bit of it does. Um, and we'll be looking to take meaningful steps on, on really a number of fronts um, to start putting these things into law, into action, to start funding them. So, so we, we've, got, we've, got, um, we've got a lot of hope and big expectations. Um, and, and again, we'll need a lot of people behind us um, to, to make these things possible. Um, so, Stay tuned. Thank you for being a good sport and answering this <laughs> huge question succinctly. Uh, really, I'm also queuing it up so that I can make another pitch for, for folks to shape the legislature by, by voting uh, because all of these issues are gonna be really important and we need to make sure that we've got conservation champions. Um, again, I can say that. <laughs> Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. A, a special note of thanks to Director Hannah Pingree and Senior Climate Resiliency Coordinator Brian Ambrett. Thank you both so much for being here today. Um, everyone, we will send out a follow-up email this afternoon with a link to this recording and a couple of follow-ups. Uh, we really welcome your feedback. So take the time to, to fill out that survey that we'll send around and let us know what you think. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's program, I en encourage you to join us every Friday in this spot, um, noon to one. Next Friday, September 25th, uh, Nicolene Iacono, who is a wild plant educator and the owner of Vessel and Vine in Brunswick will join us to discuss foraging throughout the seasons. Uh, that makes me feel a little bit squeamish. So I think the very top thing on, uh, on Nicolene's agenda for next week is telling us how to identify wild edibles safely. Um, thanks again, Hannah and Brian. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend.